make a short video looking at some of the text of our next great historian that we're reading. Um, I believe you started him already today. Uh, his name is Polybius. And Polybius um, gives us our history of the Punic Wars. Um, and Polybius is an interesting story because he is actually from, from the Greek world originally, um, and he was captured by the Romans. Um, and during his time in Rome, in kind of exile or whatever, prison of sorts, um, he came to live with the family, um, the Scipio family is the name. And the Scipios would end up kind of taking him in. He would um, serve as a scribe of sorts for one of the Scipios, the Scipio who um, would eventually serve as the commander of the Roman armies in the Third Punic Wars, the ones that actually destroyed Carthage once and for all. So Polybius gets a really close look at Rome from the inside. He gets um, he gets kind of a, a firsthand view of what they're all about. Um, and he writes this history with a specific goal in mind. Um, the Greek world had seen themselves as kind of, you know, the great civilization on earth. And their plan was to resist the Romans at all costs. In fact, Polybius was part of that plan at the, in the uh, early stages of his life. Um, we don't want to be taken over by the Romans. Um, the Romans were not seen to be as cultured, as great as the Greek world. But what Polybius found is that these Romans were... Um, so strong, so powerful, that their institutions were so strong that he believed the Greeks needed to um, kind of acquiesce and allow the Romans to come in. So part of the reason he wrote this history is to show the Greeks that it is not worth fighting against the Romans. And how do you show that? Well, you show another civilization, a great civilization, a civilization that has perhaps the world's greatest general at the time, a man by the name of Hannibal. And you show that this great civilization, even with all of its advantages, could not beat Rome. So how could we beat Rome, right? That's one of the, the reasons this is written. But we'll get to all that as we go through um, a little bit more of the text. For now, I want to look at this first portion um, that we read, because this is the part where um, Polybius takes the government and the institutions and the culture of Rome and compares it directly with that of Carthage. And this is one of the places where Rome um, comes out on top in terms of what they have to offer. Um, I, I'm hoping you have figured out where Carthage is in the world. If you haven't, um, it's in North Africa. Um, if you find a map, you should be able to look up a map of, of Carthage and, and locate it. It's where Tunisia is today. Um, but Carthage was originally a colony, um, and it's one of those places where the colony became greater than the actual or original state in terms of its power. Think of the United States kind of surpassing England in terms of its power, that kind of thing. That's what Carthage did. Carthage was a colony of the Phoenicians. And if you remember, the Phoenicians... Um, in the ancient world were incredibly good boat builders. They had an incredibly great navy. They were traders. And Carthage um, was just like that. They had this awesome navy. It allowed them to build up a pretty powerful empire, an empire that um, grew much faster than Rome's. Um, but by the time the Punic Wars had, had come on, had started to kind of um, on its downhill trajectory, at least according to Polybius. So I'll show you um, what Polybius has to say about this right here. And I'm, I'm pulling out a passage from the first paragraph. For as nature is assigned to every body, every government, and every action, three successive periods, the first, the growth, the second, perfection, and that which follows, decay. So this is the idea. States start off building and growing. Um, and at the beginnings of the Punic War, Rome was still very much at that growing stage, right? They were maybe just reaching, in Polybius's mind, um, the beginnings of that perfection, that, that really pinnacle of their being stage. Whereas um, 
Polybius believes that Carthage had already reached its pinnacle. And once a state is great like that, reaches its peak, the only place to go is down. This should sound familiar. Think about Croesus. Think about virtually everybody we've talked about this year who talks about this wheel of fortune, how when things become great, eventually fortune will make them fall apart. And this is what Polybius says is happening here. Carthage is no longer as great. Um, he talks about um, how the Carthaginians fight versus the Romans. For Carthage, an incredibly wealthy, wealthy, wealthy country, what they tended to do was pay mercenaries to fight for them, right? They did have, yes, some of their soldiers, but because they were traitors and because they did not necessarily like to fight on land, they did not really have a big army. And so they would either pay people or force people that they've conquered to march out in front of them and, and fight. Whereas the Romans, according to Polybius, fought for themselves, right? So it says at the, the bottom of this, uh, this passage that I have highlighted, for while the Carthaginians entrust the preservation of their liberty to the care of venal troops, venal troops meaning troops who are paid, the Romans place all of their confidence in their own bravery and in the assistance of the, their allies, so people who love them. So again, showing an advantage for the Romans. Now, some of the advantages, Polybius, well, he may have gotten wrong, and it may come from a little bit of that, um, <laughs> I guess, racist, culturalist uh, problems of, of the European. Now, the people of Italy are by nature superior to the Carthaginians and the Africans, both in bodily strength and in courage. Um, for Polybius, this was a natural difference, that that the folks who lived in Italy were just naturally superior than those who lived across the Mediterranean. Obviously, this is just not true, all right? But this is something that has um, remained part of kind of Western culture. Well, I can end the sentence there. It has remained. As you read through, you're going to see all of these different places where Polybius thinks Rome has a society which is really kind of prepared for this. Um, and one of the ways they prepare for this is by instilling a sense of honor in the Roman youth and in the Roman people throughout their lives. So all of their lives are filled with these rituals that, that over and over and over again beat into their heads the idea that honor and dying with honor and fighting for honor is everything. Um, and so... You see, you'll see stories here about funerals and how people do this. Um, he says at the end of this passage, by this method, which renews continually the remembrance of men celebrated for their virtue, the fame of every great and noble action becomes immortal. Notice, it is the virtue of these men that are being repeated over and over again, the stories of virtue. And you can think about the two stories you have read so far, right? Lucretia. Um uh, and and Horatius, right? These are stories of Roman virtue. Um, in fact, Polybius at the bottom here gives an example, and look at the example he chooses. Horatius at the bridge. What's pretty interesting here is he's clearly heard a different version. In his version, when the bridge was broken and the city secured from insult, he threw himself into the river with his armor and there lost his life as he had designed having preferred the safety of his country and the future fame that was sure to follow such an action to his own present existence. How about that? He'd rather die knowing he would be honored. This idea of honor being so crucial to the Romans. Um, and the story here, it makes more sense if he dies, right? He is so willing, he wants this honor so much, he's willing to die for it. You'll remember in the Livy version, Horatio makes it across. Here he does not. Um, finally, he talks more about the kind of, um, problems that the Carthaginians see within their empire that the Romans have yet to experience. And I think the word yet is important here. He says all governments will eventually start to give way to things like corruption and decay. But so far, the Romans 
have been completely free from this, he says. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know many um, ancient Roman politicians. But in his mind, the Roman state seems to be a virtuous one. And this virtue gives them a distinct advantage over a place like Carthage, which he says is on decline and thus corrupted. Um, and he gives a little bit of, I guess he finishes us with a little bit of a statement about all great societies. And I think this is an interesting thing for us to keep in mind when we get to the end of the Roman Empire. And, I mean, we could apply it to our own um, society if we wanted he says, it's manifest that the long continuance of prosperity must give birth to costly and luxurious manners. The idea is that if you are wealthy and doing well for so long, sooner or later, you're going to take it for granted and you're going to start acting um, luxuriously, right? Decadently. You're going to start doing things that, um, that, let's face it, much of the rest of the world makes fun of Americans for, right? Gorging ourselves, these huge plates of food and, um, you know, all of those things. We're going to see if that happens in Rome too. It says, and as these evils are continually increased, the desire of power and rule and the imagine ign, 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 I can't even say it, ign, ignominy, ignominy, there we go, of remaining in a subject state will first begin to work the ruin of the republic. Arrogance and luxury will afterwards advance it, and in the end, the change will be completed by the people. Look at what he says there. We're not going to want to be part of a ruled class. We're not going to be satisfied, the people, the masses, as being just ruled. We're going to want to be in charge, right? As soon as we get so used to having all this luxury and things like that, we're going to want this power too. All of us are going to have this ambition. None of us are going to be willing to kind of defer to what he might call our betters. And he says at the very end, when this is done, the government will assume indeed the fairest of all names, that of a free and popular state. Yay, everybody loves the idea of democracy, free state, but will in truth be the greatest of all evils, the government of the multitude, the masses of people, the people that it seems he might think are unfit to rule, eventually take over in all states. And when that happens, it's the beginning of the end. Anyhow, this is just the first um, reading from Polybius. He is my favorite of the, um, of the ancient uh, historians. I, like, I love Thucydides and Herodotus, but I love Polybius even more. And maybe because... Um, reading about Hannibal is so much fun. Um, I, I hope you have a you'll have a short video about the Punic Wars, but I'm sure I'm going to jump back in because I do love this topic so much. I hope this helps a little bit as you try to pull some details out of this reading um, from yesterday. Um, if you have any questions, once again, please let me know. Thanks.